The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of You're Included, theologian Dr. Paul Molnar talks about the importance of keeping Christ at the center of our thoughts about God. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fizell. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. My pleasure. We wanted to begin by talking about your book, the Thomas F. Torrance, Theologian of the Trinity. Uh, tell us about how you came to know uh, Thomas Torrance and how you came to write the book. It started really back in the early 1980s when I read his book, Reality in Evangelical Theology. That was my first exposure to Torrance's writing and I really enjoyed it a lot. I remember that I was at a theological conference and someone asked me who your favorite theologian was. And most of the people at the conference had Carl Rahner as their favorite theologian. So I said, actually, my favorite theologian is Thomas F. Torrance. I had read that book and then I had read a couple others besides when I got that question. And the person looked at me like I had three heads because he never heard of Thomas F. Torrance. Um, and subsequently I read basically most of his writings, and I was quite impressed with his writings. Uh, for good reason, Tor Torrance is thought of as the uh, most important British theologian of the 20th century. He taught for many years at the University of Edinburgh. He didn't formally teach the doctrine of the Trinity for uh, political reasons, because another professor was teaching that course. Uh, but he, he did work the doctrine into all of his lectures in Christology and so on. Uh, and he wrote, he didn't write his books on the Trinity until after he retired, his two major works on the Trinity. But what impressed me most about Torrance was his uh, vast knowledge of patristic theology and his ability to not only demonstrate a clear understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity, but to show how the doctrine of the Trinity functioned, uh, enlightening us in our knowledge of Christ, of the Incarnation, of atonement, of redemption, of, of ascension, resurrection, of the church and the sacraments. So the reason I came to write this book was to really show uh, that side of Torrance, which I was most interested in, his dogmatic theology. Torrance, of course, is famous for doing work in theology and science, which is also very, very important and very good. But my, spe my special emphasis in this book was looking at his dogmatic theology and showing how Trinitarian thinking really shaped all of his doctrines, and um, so that's where I went with this book. And you've met him a couple of times. I did indeed. I, uh, uh, I uh, invited him to St. John's University in 1997 with the help of his son Ian, who, who was able to, uh, who, who actually introduced me to him and uh, enabled me to, uh, to bring him to St. John's. So he came to St. John's to speak on Einstein and God and he also gave that same lecture at Princeton and Yale in 1997. And while he was there, I had lots of time to actually personally get to know him. We had dinner together, we had lunch together, we had quiet time together, driving in the car together, we talked theology. Right. It was a great experience for me because by that point, I had been reading him for 15, 16 years, so I really held him in awe, to be honest with you, so just to be able to speak with him. I remember one morning when I went to pick him up at the hotel, he said, call me Tom. So my tongue nearly froze in my mouth. <laughs> when he said that, I couldn't call him Tom. You know, he's Professor Torrance, you know, a great theologian. And when I introduced him to the audience at St. John's, uh, he had sent me a, a, a CV about this thick. And uh, he said, just introduce me. I'm just a humble minister of the gospel. So that wasn't going to fly for me. So I, having had this CV this thick, I was going to say something. So I went through a long explanation of how important he was and the work he had done and so on and so forth. I'm not sure how, how well that pleased him, but he was quite polite about the whole thing. <laughs> and then um, he basically said that that would be, he was in his 80s, though at that time he was quite young and we really had good exchanges during the lecture and the question and answer session. And we took him to dinner afterwards and he had good exchanges with members of the theology department and the philosophy department. Um, but he did indicate that that would probably be his last trip to the United States and that if I wanted to see him again, I would have to see him in Scotland. Which, as, as it happened, I did get to do two years later when I was lecturing at St. Andrews and at Aberdeen. Um, I did visit him at his house on Braid Farm Road, Road in Edinburgh 
And in his study, uh, we sat and chatted for at least three or four hours, and it was quite an experience. I learned a great deal from him, and we had many exchanges of emails and letters. Uh, and he would send papers to me that he had written, and I would send papers to him, and he would write back to me with comments on them. So I really got to know him quite well, and, and of course, I learned a great deal from him. And he's, he's affected my thinking a great deal. One of the major premises of my book, Divine Freedom, was that uh, to think accurately about God, we would have to think from a center in God and not from a center in ourselves. That I learned uh, from Tom Torrance. Also, in my book on Incarnation and Resurrection, I learned the main thesis of the book from him, which is that you need to hold the Incarnation and the Resurrection together if you're going to have a clear understanding of the meaning of the Resurrection. What that mean, meant to him was this, that if you tried to think about Jesus' Resurrection in abstraction from the Incarnation, you would have what he called a rather docetic view of the, of the Resurrection. And a docetic view of the resurrection in his mind meant that you would undermine the fact that Jesus rose bodily from the dead. It would just be an ideal description of something uh, that may simply describe the disciples' reactions to Jesus, or it may describe uh, some person's idea of life after death. Uh, but it, 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 wouldn't be, it wouldn't be an idea dictated by the fact that the resurrection was really the completion of the Incarnation in that it was also the completion of our reconciliation with God by the fact that Jesus was raised bodily from the dead. So, so his, his thinking has affected my thinking a great deal. Many people have a sense that the, that the Incarnation ended at the resurrection. In other words, Jesus does not continue to be fully human for yes, us. Yes, yes. And it throws them upon into a, even in prayer you're thinking of Jesus as being fully God, but you're no longer thinking of him as being fully human. Fully. Yes, yes. Torrance, uh, I think, spent a great deal of his life work undermining that idea. And why would it be important for Torrance to undermine that idea? It would be important because if Christ is not risen from the dead and ascended into heaven, and continually mediating between us and the Father in his full divinity and full humanity, then in his mind, we really have no human connection with God. Uh, that's one way of putting it. Another way of putting it is that we're not really saved humanly. Um, so, so for Torrance, Jesus' continuing mediation, high priestly mediation, is of the utmost importance because if he is not the continuing mediator between us and God, then something else or someone else would have to be inserted into his place and would become for us the, med the supposed mediation between us and God. And of course, we would be cut off from God by even thinking of such a a another mediator, because there is no such thing. It would compromise God's oneness and, and God's threeness, right? God mediates himself to us, the Father through the Son in the Spirit, and to even suppose that there could be uh, some intermediary other than Jesus Christ, the Word of God incarnate, who continues to mediate humanly and divinely, would actually compromise both his divinity and his humanity and the meaning of our salvation. So there's a lot at stake. Well, <clears throat> what are some examples of other mediators that uh, anyone has proposed? Um, well, for example, uh, there are theologians that we, we spoke about before who, uh, who tend to emphasize what they call a theocentric theology so that they could have the world religions agree about God, and so they would, they would want to, in, the, in their theocentrism, they would want to avoid a Christocentrism that would see Christ as the exclusive revealer and exclusive savior of the world. So such theologians might argue that Christians could believe in Jesus as their savior, but not as the savior for everyone else, because that would be a kind of exclusivism that would impose Christianity, Christianity on other religions, and would undermine uh, a proper pluralism in their estimation. But for Torrance, you can't really be theocentric at all unless you're Christocentric because Christ is the one mediator who not only mediates God to us, but us to God. So that by sharing in his human knowledge of God, we actually have true knowledge of God. But for Torrance, that's not something you can have 
if you construct a theocentrism that bypasses Jesus Christ, because that's essentially Unitarian theology. That's, and that would be the, the idea that, uh, <clears throat> that all roads lead to the same God, and that, uh, that as long as you have a belief in God, then, then that's the main thing, as opposed to recognizing that Jesus is the revelation of the Father. That's right. <clears throat> so, uh, now, people that hold that view, that sort of theocentrism, as opposed to Christocentrism, um, they're basically thinking that Christocentrism is the product of, of the church's response to Jesus. Christocentrism meaning putting, meaning Christ, at the putting Christ at the center. Seeing Christ as the exclusive savior, for example, or as the ex exclusive revealer. So they argue against the whole notion of exclusivism because they want to sound more open in a pluralistic society to other religions. But in reality, in my mind, what they've done is they've given up the truth of the Christian faith because what makes Christ unique and exclusively the revealer and savior of the world is his eternal being as the only begotten son of the Father. So it's not something that's grounded in, in the reaction of the community, not the Christian community, not any community. So this is why Taritz rejected what he called Ebionite Christology and Docetic Christology. When he did his Christology, he explicitly stated that he didn't want to begin from below, as in Ebionite Christology, or from above, as in Docetic Christology. Let me define the terms. For him, Ebionite Christology would be any sort of Christology which saw Jesus as an ordinary human being, who actually became the Son of God at some point in his life history, or perhaps at the resurrection. Or it was, it was a Christology that held that Jesus was, was an already existing human being into whom the Word descended at some point in his life. For Taurus, the, the miracle of the virgin birth signifies that the eternally, begot, eternally begotten Son mysteriously, miraculously became incarnate took flesh from the Virgin Mary through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a miracle. It can't be explained. It can only be acknowledged. And therefore, for Torrance, he would say, as he does in his book on the Incarnation, that we must begin thinking Christologically with the fact of Jesus Christ. And for him, the fact of Jesus Christ cannot be established historically from below, because if you just start with history, in his mind, all of your results theologically or conceptually will be historical results. We must start in faith, recognizing and acknowledging who Jesus actually is. So, so he opposed that sort of Ebionite Christology, which suggested that it was the community's response to Jesus and that people thought of him as a God that made him unique in that sense, as an extraordinary human figure who people thought of as divine. But he wouldn't really be divine. So in Doris's mind, it's the deity of Christ that actually gives meaning to his human history because the hypostatic union in his mind, the second person of the Trinity, the hypostasis becoming incarnate, is precisely the one who posits into existence his human history. So there is no human history apart from his divine being. So, and then docetic Christology is the idea that Jesus is just one particular historical embodiment of, of who God is, but not the embodiment of, of who God is. So Torrance would re reject both Christology from below and from above, arguing that we must begin by accepting his true humanity and true divinity from the outset. That raises the question of um, Jesus was perfect yes. and, and full, obeyed his Father's commands and so on, and yet, uh, as Torrance argues, he took our fallen nature on himself, that which is not uh, assumed. assumed is not redeemed. Yes. How can both be true? How can he be perfect and yet take our fallen nature on himself? Let me give you a, what might, may sound, to sound like a perplexing answer to that question at first. First of all, I think Torrance would say we can't explain how that can be so. Because if we could, uh, we wouldn't need to acknowledge it and to begin thinking about the reality in faith. But uh, beyond that, he would say it can be so because in becoming human, in, in assuming our fallen human nature into union with his divine being, God healed uh, our self-will and therefore our sin, beginning 
with his becoming incarnate and continuing throughout his whole life of obedience through to his death on the cross and completed in the resurrection and ascension. So he would want to say that God never surrendered his divinity in becoming incarnate and so precisely he could forgive our sins because he was God incarnate but he could also from the human side live our, uh, our reconciliation subjectively in his perfect life of obedience. Um, so Torrance would say that unless Christ, uh, unless the Word actually assumed our fallen human nature, he wouldn't have come all the way to us within our human history. So he would want to say that, uh, that redemption takes place within the personal being of the mediator, both uh, so, that it, so that when when Jesus suffers God forsakenness in obeying the Father, uh, he lives out a, a human life in the midst of sin and temptation, in the midst of stresses and strains that would want to divide the unity that took place in the hypostatic union, but, but in the end did not do so. And the hypostatic so, union being, being our union with Christ in his no, thinking. No, the hypostatic union being the unique union of the divine word and the human nature of Jesus, uh, we participate in Jesus' new, uh, new humanity through faith in him. So Torrance would want to say that the hypostatic union is absolutely, utterly unique. There is no analogy for it in experience or in, in any f form of knowing. So that's why he would say of, of uh, Jesus that Jesus himself is an ultimate. He says Jesus is an ultimate no, Jesus is the ultimate. And by ultimate, he means that in any science, you have to work with certain ultimates, without which the science wouldn't make any sense. Uh, and those ultimates cannot be proven or justified on any other grounds other than the fact that they are what they are. So he would say that Jesus is who he is, the Word of God incarnate. So the hypostatic union is that utterly unique event in, uh, uh, signifying that Jesus, the Word, was born of the Virgin Mary, uh, and that he was therefore truly divine and truly human throughout his entire life. And so he would want to then say that because Jesus is the ultimate, there's no ground for verifying who Jesus is outside of, of Jesus himself. So that's why it's so important to recognize that in the in, uh, resurrection and ascension, Jesus con continues to live and interact with us even now. So that for Taurus, to speak of the Holy Spirit is really to speak of the Holy Spirit uniting us to Christ. So if you spoke of the Spirit and weren't speaking of our union with Christ through that Spirit and therefore through faith, you really weren't speaking in and by and through and about the Holy Spirit at all. So, so that's crucially important, the fact that Jesus is the ultimate. Because what it means to Torrance is that those theologians uh, who try to, uh, uh, to verify who Jesus is in his uniqueness by a study of history, or try to try to verify who Jesus is by some sort of a priori Christology, or would say someone like Arana calls a searching Christology, that suggests that we can construct an understanding of of uh, what humanity is and what humanity is searching for, and in that search discover the true meaning of Jesus. Torrance would reject that sort of thinking because he would say. If that's the route that we pursue, then it's our search that becomes determinative for who Jesus is. We're no longer absolutely in need of and relying on Jesus himself, who at present is actually disclosing to us who he is. So, so that would be seriously problematic. And it becomes problematic, if I could just give one example. Uh, you can see it in the contrast between, I have it in my book on divine freedom in chapter 6, where I contrast Torrance and Rahner on their interpretations of the resurrection. Uh, Arana says that he's not going to begin with Jesus Christ but with our transcendental experience. So Arana actually argues that uh, wherever anyone has hope for some sort of life beyond death, that person already experiences the meaning of the resurrection. He even says perhaps anonymously. Well, Torrance would say you can't have an experience of the resurrection anonymously because to have an experience of the resurrection is to know that Jesus Christ himself was raised from the dead and is as such the mediator who empowers us to know God conceptually. So he would say to Rana, you're really holding what I would call a non-conceptual understanding of God. And Rana does indeed hold such an understanding 
when he argues that we have unthematic knowledge of God, anonymous knowledge of God. Uh, Torrance would say, there is no such thing as anonymous knowledge of God. Either you know God because your concepts are tied to the events depicted in, in, the, in the gospel story, his incarnation, his resurrection, his preaching, his, his ascension. Uh, either you know God conceptually or you don't know God truly at all. What you're describing is your own experience symbolically interpreted. And Torrance was dead against that sort of thing. What is the right explanation then for um, the idea of a person who doesn't know Christ and yet uh, experiences uh, good and uh, good things and, and lives out good things and so on, since uh, Christ is the only source of what is good, um, isn't there a, a sense in which there's a participation in that which one doesn't know what he's participating in yet? In one sense, everybody is in, in, in relation with Jesus Christ. But theologically, to understand what that means, one would first have to understand who Jesus Christ was and what he did. Otherwise, the danger in the statement that you made to me is that one could argue that as long as one is a good person, one is already a Christian. I don't think we, wa we would want to equate simply the idea of being good with being a Christian because, in fact, in being good, we could actually then rely on our own goodness with the idea that by being good, uh, God somehow owes us our righteousness. In fact, however, Torrance argues that when Christ died for the sins of the world, he died not just for the bad part of us, but for the good part of us. So I think by that he means that just by being good, we're not necessarily thereby Christian. Yes, no, we're talking about two different things in right. a sense. We're talking about what is the nature of the, uh, the unbeliever mm -hmm. or the non-believer, the, the not yet believer, right. however we want to say it, mm -hmm. um, in terms of their union with Christ by virtue of his incarnation yes. on behalf of humanity. That on one side and then the, the, the nature of the relationship of the believer uh, on the other. Um, not that the non unbeliever is, is, is a Christian, yes. but nevertheless, the non-believer is taken up into Christ in, in his incarnation. That's right. And Objectively. Right. And, um, and there's, a, to that degree, a participation in Christ, whether he knows it or not. True. Uh, but, but the believer then enters into a relationship that is... Uh, personal and is is knowing and and is a fellowship friendship walking with God a, a an actual worshipful um, personal relationship that, that that transcends the other yeah maybe I should make let me clarify something that I said a few minutes ago when I was talking about Rana's statement to the effect that that those who have ex an experience of hope have an experience of the resurrection whether they know it or not. Um, what, that, what that tends to mean in his thought is that we can rely on our experiences of hope in order to explain the meaning of Christ's resurrection. The problem that I was pointing out was that for Torrance, you can't even explain the resurrection by exploring people's experiences of hope because the resurrection is its own explanation. We need to rely on the risen Lord himself to make sense of it to us. So when Rahner argued that you could have an anonymous experience of the resurrection just by having hope for eternal life, uh, I think Torrance would see that as a rather docetic explanation of the resurrection because it's really equating the meaning of the resurrection with our hope for something beyond death. And, and that's the point that I was trying to get at with that. So while it is possible I mean, it is a reality that Christ died for the sins of the world, so that everyone is somehow already included in his resurrection. The difference between Christians and others is that Christians recognize the meaning of that statement. And, and any attempt to sort of neutralize that statement by equating 
an experience of a knowledge of the resurrection with our experiences of hope for life beyond death really subverts the need to believe in Christ's bodily resurrection and understand that as the meaning of eternal life itself. So it could actually undermine the reality of eternal life, at least conceptually, because you would be equating it with something that's a universal experience instead of recognizing that it's something that can only be had and understood in faith by an actual union with the risen Lord himself. It, it loses specificity. Does that, does that make better sense? I think so. I, th I think it, it'd be the, the difference between um, recognizing that, to use an analogy, uh, maybe not a very good one, but we all have a shadow if we're standing out in the sun. Yes. And uh, if you look at the shadow and then try to explain from the shadow uh, what it means to be a, a human being, well, it would be, you, you wouldn't be able to get there from there. Right. But that doesn't mean that the shadow is not, in fact, uh, uh, related right. uh, in a very real and positive sense with the, uh, the human being that's casting the shadow. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. So in that sense, Christ's life, death, and resurrection casts a shadow over the entire human race, but only those that actually see uh, the meaning of the events of his life actually understand what, uh, the, the, the inner meaning. It's kind of, a, of an entry point for evangelism, it would seem, though, to be able to say to someone, um, to, to point out to them that the, uh, those things that are good in, in their nature, their, their love for their children, for example, uh, it doesn't come from nowhere. It's a reflection of who Christ is in them and with them as a human being. It, 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 doesn't, it isn't something that springs out of them, nor is it a... Uh, it just comes from nowhere. It's uh, the, the Christ is already at work in you. The Christ already is in you. Why not come? Why not acknowledge what the source of this love is and know that that you are loved and and, and accepted and and turned to Him? Does that make sense? Well, it does make sense, but the danger in that is that the focus would then be on people's experiences of love. Uh, and not on the one who empowers well, I, yeah, it. Yeah, I think I, what I mean is that uh, to help a person who, who, is, who thinks, yes. which so many do, yes. that I'm worthless, yes. God doesn't love me, I, yes. I'm, how could he? Right. I, if you knew me like I do, then yes. you wouldn't be telling me that God could actually love right. me. And so I need to get good yes. before we have this discussion. Yes. But instead, we were able to say to them, Look, God already loves you and accepts you. And and where do you think you know the this came from or that came? It, God has already done everything necessary for you. Uh, it's your it, why not you know, acknowledge that and turn to Him? Well, that makes sense. I I, I would agree with that. The um, uh, there, but that gets at the heart of where there's a lot of difficulty people have with uh, in trying to comprehend Trinitarian theology. I think yes because they will assume that, well, you're saying that if Christ, uh, Christ's um, uh, union with, with humanity through the Incarnation yes. has actually made a, a difference already, yes. and has, he has made himself one with humanity in such a way that he will not let it go and will not be who he is without humanity, yes. then you're saying that everybody, even unbelievers, are saved. Yes. And of course, that, that, that isn't uh, the point at all. The point is that everyone is, in fact, in union, but not that everyone is a believer and is participating in the relationship in the way that a believer would, in the transformational way, uh, but as, a, as a, an entry point for evangelism, you, you are able to say not that you have to do something in order to get God to to like you, but that he already does. He's already taken you up and done everything necessary That's for right. you. That's right. So it's, um, but the difficulty people have again is that they think, well, he, um, that, that if, you're just saying, you, you're, you're teaching universalism. You're saying everyone is saved no matter right. what they do because right. they're in union with Christ. Or, right. But there's a difference between being in union with Christ as right. an unbeliever and being in communion with Christ in the way that believers are. Of course. Uh, Torrance would actually say, and does say, that universalism is a form of, of rationalism. 
so he, he, re he rejects both universalism and the idea of conditional salvation because he wants to say just what you said, that what God has done by uniting God and, and humanity in the history of Jesus Christ is he has objectively uh, unified us, overcome our self-will, our attempts to be independent of him, overcome our alienation, our suffering, and even death itself in the history of Jesus. All of that has taken object place objectively, but also subjectively in that Jesus actually was faithful to God in our, pla in our place. So, that, that, so that, that is the objective and subjective justification of the sinner, you might say. So, as you said, we don't have to do anything in order for God to love us. And the very idea that we could would miss the fact uh, that he loves us while we're unlovable, in fact. Well, because we're his, his enemies. Um, so, but, but as you again say, and Torrance says at one point, well, you didn't quite say this, but it could be implied in what you say, I hope. If not, then you can correct <laughs> me. <laughs> uh, Taurus actually says that, um, uh, that we really, none of us, uh, as a matter of fact, can say who, who, who are saved and who are not saved because that's God's alone to do. And it would be rationalism in the direction of universalism to make that statement. Uh, but on the other hand, to, to say that therefore salvation is contingent on our response to the gospel would actually throw salvation back on us and miss the point, you know, the objective point that you were trying to make exactly, before. So yeah. he doesn't want to say either of those things because he's really leaving room for the grace of God, for God to act. So God does will the salvation of all and it, it is, in, in Charles's mind, utterly inexplic inexplicable that people would reject the Savior, but in fact it happened once on the cross and even after his death and resurrection, it still can happen because Christ does not force himself on people. So even, even though people's, uh, you know, the goodness that people have comes from God through Christ, they may never acknowledge that. It's a possibility. And, and even it, when they do acknowledge that, I think Torrance would also say, even that's not under their control. That's the work of the Holy Spirit sure. in empowering them to see and to live subjectively what is objectively already a reality in the life of Christ. Uh, By grace from beginning to end. Correct. You've been watching You're Included, a production of Grace Communion International.